Thank you for joining us today for this Gynecology Patient Education Seminar. I'm Dr. Lynn Kowalski, and I'm a board-certified gynecologic oncologist in Las Vegas, Nevada. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today because there have been some exciting new advances in the treatment of many common gynecologic conditions. The primary advance that I want to talk to you about today is robotic-assisted surgery. From my experience incorporating robotic surgery into my practice, I hope to give you a feeling of the many benefits of minimally invasive surgery. During the course of our program today, I will discuss different gynecologic problems, their symptoms and their treatment options, including surgical options. I will provide an overview of robotic-assisted gynecologic surgery, which in many situations is your most effective, least invasive surgical option. Common operations now available with robotic-assisted surgery include hysterectomy, myomectomy, and cancer surgery. A number of diseases and conditions that gynecologists treat affect various parts of the female reproductive system. Before I discuss these further, let's quickly review the anatomy of the female organs. The uterus is the muscular organ pictured here in the center of the diagram. The uterus or womb is where pregnancies develop. At the top portion of the uterus, coming off of each side, are the fallopian tubes, which deliver the fertilized eggs to the uterus for implantation. The ovaries are the reproductive organs which contain the eggs and also produce hormones. When an egg is fertilized, it travels down the fallopian tubes to the uterus. The myometrium is the muscular wall of the uterus, while the endometrium is the uterine lining that is shed every month during a menstrual cycle, unless, of course, a pregnancy develops. At the bottom of the uterus is the cervix, which opens into the vagina or birth canal. Here I have listed some of the gynecologic conditions that we'll talk about today. Because many of these conditions are treated with surgery, many women are faced with the prospect of a hysterectomy at some point in their lives. These conditions include fibroids, pelvic masses, abnormal bleeding, endometriosis, pelvic floor disorders, precancer, and cancer. Let's talk a bit more about fibroids because they are very common. Fibroids are benign tumors that arise from the muscular wall of the uterus. They can grow in different parts of the uterus and they can vary in size, location, and severity of symptoms. They can be as small as a pea or as big as a melon or even larger. Pedunculated fibroids describe when the fibroid comes off of a stalk that is attached to the uterus. Subserosal fibroids usually bulge out from the outer aspect of the uterine wall, whereas submucosal fibroids bulge in towards the uterine cavity. Fibroids within the muscular wall itself are called intramural fibroids. Different types of fibroids can result in different types of symptoms. The most common symptoms fibroids cause are abnormal bleeding and pain. The bleeding can result in heavy periods or irregular bleeding. Fibroids can also lead to a bulging sensation in your pelvic area, and they can cause pain, particularly pain with intercourse. They can also contribute to difficulties getting pregnant or a sense of urinary urgency due to the fibroids pushing on the bladder. There are a number of different treatment options for fibroids. If you have no symptoms, then most physicians elect to follow the fibroids conservatively, just keeping an eye on them and making sure that they are not growing or causing problems. Sometimes fibroids can be shrunk with medications. There are medications such as Lupron or GnRH agonists that induce a temporary menopausal state. Without the hormones, the fibroids tend to shrink. However, this treatment is only temporary. Another technique is called uterine artery embolization, and this will stop the blood flow to the fibroid, often resulting in shrinkage. This requires a procedure usually done by a radiologist to insert a small device into the blood vessels feeding the fibroid, thus blocking its blood flow. Another option to try to shrink the fibroids involves ablative techniques, such as radiofrequency ablation or endometrial ablation. Endometrial ablation is more successful in the case of small submucosal fibroids. Surgical options include removing the fibroid by going through the cervix. This is called a hysteroscopic resection and is often done for small submucosal fibroids. A myomectomy involves making an incision on the uterus, removing the fibroids, but preserving the remainder of the uterus. 
A myomectomy is reserved for fibroids that interfere with fertility. Fibroids usually grow back after these procedures, however, and often hysterectomy is necessary. Hysterectomy is the definitive solution to fibroids. Now let's talk about endometriosis. Endometriosis occurs when there is a growth of endometrial tissue outside of the uterus. The endometrium normally lines the uterus and is shed every month during menstruation. However, a small amount of the tissue will back up during menstruation and can be found coming through the fallopian tubes and lodging on other organs in the pelvic area. This tissue can grow on the surface of the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, on the surface of the outside of the bladder or the intestines, and can also be found within the vagina or the rectum. Symptoms of endometriosis include pain, particularly extremely painful periods. Sometimes endometriosis can develop into chronic pelvic pain. Women can also have painful bowel movements or pain during or after intercourse. Endometriosis can also cause difficulty getting pregnant. Treatment options for milder cases of endometriosis often revolve around pain management. Oral contraceptives, given continuously, can often help the endometriosis deposits to shrink. Pain medicines such as ibuprofen or naproxen can also be effective. For more difficult cases, medical therapy can help, again using GnRH agonists, which induce a menopausal state. Without hormonal stimulation, the endometriosis tends to shrink away. For more severe cases, surgery may be required. This can involve removing or resecting the endometriotic implants from the pelvic area. Some physicians will also use techniques such as laser ablation or ablation with other types of electrical energies to destroy the endometriosis implants. Ultimately, the only true cure for endometriosis involves complete hysterectomy. When a woman no longer has menstrual periods, very often the endometriosis implants will regress. For very severe cases, hysterectomy, along with the removal of the ovaries and tubes, may be required in order to completely remove all of the abnormal tissue and to control the symptoms. Next, I would like to talk about pelvic floor disorders. These occur when the muscular floor of the pelvis becomes weakened by trauma, usually from vaginal births or from chronic conditions that put stress on the pelvic floor, like coughing from emphysema or obesity. Pelvic prolapse is actually a type of hernia, and when it occurs, the bladder, the vagina, the uterus, or the rectum can begin to drop through the pelvic floor and out through the vagina. Symptoms of pelvic floor disorders can include a pelvic heaviness or a feeling of fullness, a feeling like something is falling out through the vagina, pain during intercourse, anal pain or pressure, low back pain, and difficulty controlling the urine. Urinary incontinence is a very common symptom of a pelvic floor disorder. Disorders of the pelvic floor can be treated in a variety of ways. More mild cases can often be controlled with pelvic exercises or biofeedback. Sometimes the physician will place a device called a pessary in the vagina, which helps to hold the pelvic organs up and in the proper position. Surgery, however, is sometimes required to fix the defect. A hysterectomy may be required if the uterus itself is prolapsing through. However, doing a hysterectomy alone will not fix the hernia defect. Some type of suspension of the vaginal vault is required in order to restore the strength to the pelvic floor. These types of procedures can be performed through the vagina, but more traditionally have been performed through an abdominal incision. Some surgeons now offer a minimally invasive approach to suspending the vaginal vault. A successful vaginal vault suspension requires strong sutures being placed in a good position that will result in a long-term cure for the problem. This can be technically difficult to perform with conventional laparoscopic techniques. Finally, bladder suspension or urethral sling procedures are commonly performed for prolapse of the bladder or for urinary incontinence. Precancer is another common gynecologic condition that causes great anxiety for many women because of its relationship to cancer. Billions of dollars are spent in the United States each year treating millions of women for this problem, hopefully to prevent cervical or endometrial cancers from ever occurring. Precancerous cells are abnormal cells that can grow on the cervix or the endometrial lining. 
They can also occur in the lining of the vagina or on the skin of the vulva. These sites are less common. When you have a pap smear, your gynecologist is looking for abnormal cells on the cervix that could predict an increased risk of cervical cancer. However, precancers, unlike cancers, cannot spread or invade other parts of the body. Therefore, in and of themselves, they are not dangerous. But if left untreated, they can become cancers over time. Precancers of the cervix are without symptoms, but precancers of the endometrial lining can often cause abnormal bleeding. Your gynecologist will often order an ultrasound if she is concerned that you may have endometrial precancer, but ultimately the diagnosis must be based on a biopsy, either done in the office or by a dilation and curatage, also known as a DNC. Treatment options for precancers of the cervix usually involve removing the abnormal part of the cervix. Occasionally, a freezing procedure can be performed to achieve the same results. Common procedures for removing the abnormal part of the cervix include a LEAP procedure or a cervical cone biopsy. Endometrial precancer, on the other hand, is usually treated with hysterectomy. However, there are some situations where hormonal treatment can be used. Side effects from the hormonal treatments can be severe and many women elect to proceed with hysterectomy. Cancers of the female reproductive organs are fortunately uncommon. However, abnormal symptoms suggestive of cancer are similar to symptoms from some of the benign conditions we have just reviewed. The uncertainty these symptoms cause is often a great source of anxiety for many women. Symptoms of gynecologic cancers can include irregular bleeding, with prolonged or more frequent periods. Any bleeding that occurs in a postmenopausal woman should be considered cancer until proven otherwise. A pink, watery, or bloody vaginal discharge can also be suggestive of a gynecologic cancer. Pelvic pain or discomfort can be from a variety of causes, but certainly it can be a sign of a cancer developing. Bleeding with intercourse is also abnormal and if it occurs repeatedly, you should see your gynecologist right away. Irregular bowel or bladder function can also be caused by many different conditions, but can be a sign of a gynecologic cancer. Finally, abdominal pressure or bloating that persists over time should be evaluated by your physician. Endometrial cancer, or cancer of the lining of the uterus, is the most common gynecologic cancer. Fortunately, it's usually detected at an early stage because it very commonly causes postmenopausal bleeding. When a woman notices this bleeding, she usually gets evaluation quickly. Endometrial cancers are almost always treated with surgery unless the patient has severe medical problems that preclude an operation. Cervical cancer can be caught early and hopefully prevented by getting regular pap smears. Treating cervical precancer can prevent development of cancer. Early cervical cancers are usually detected by an abnormal pap smear. In most cases, women are still without symptoms at the time of detection. For more advanced cases of cervical cancer, women can begin to have symptoms including abnormal bleeding, abnormal vaginal discharge, or bleeding after intercourse. 50% of advanced cases of cervical cancer occur in women who have never had a pap smear in their entire life and another 25% of advanced cases occur in women who have not had a pap smear in the last four years or more. Early stages of cervical cancer are usually treated with surgery, although radiation is just as effective. More advanced cases are treated with radiation, usually in combination with chemotherapy. Ovarian cancer is sometimes known as the silent killer because it can grow without symptoms until it is very advanced. If you are diagnosed with an early case of ovarian cancer, with proper surgery and chemotherapy, you have an excellent chance of cure. Unfortunately, most women are diagnosed with more advanced stage disease. This is because there is no screening test for ovarian cancer. Now, you may be confused by articles you read in women's magazines or by information you see on television about a blood test called a CA-125. A CA-125 is not a screening test for ovarian cancer, and it is not designed to detect the disease at an early stage. Nor is it designed to distinguish between benign or cancerous conditions. 
Unfortunately, most of the symptoms of ovarian cancer do not become obvious until the cancer has grown and spread within the abdominal cavity. There are a number of treatment options for women with gynecologic cancers. Most of these involve surgery. For very young women with early stage cervical cancer, we sometimes perform an operation called a trachelectomy. Otherwise, most cases of early cervical cancer are treated with an operation called a radical hysterectomy, along with the removal of the lymph nodes in the pelvic area. Uterine cancers are usually treated with a complete hysterectomy, as well as removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes. In addition, the surgery also includes removal of the pelvic lymph nodes and removal of lymph nodes higher up in the abdominal cavity called the paraaortic lymph nodes. Surgeries for ovarian cancer can be much more extensive, but usually involve a complete hysterectomy, removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes, removal of lymph nodes in the pelvic and periortic area, removal of an internal fatty pad called the omentum, and a number of biopsies from the abdominal cavity. Radiation and chemotherapy often have important roles in the treatment of gynecologic cancers, but they are usually used for more advanced stages of cancer. Hysterectomy is the second most common surgical procedure performed on women. This is because it is the best solution for many types of common gynecologic conditions. About 650,000 hysterectomies are performed annually in the United States alone. Most of these are still performed through abdominal incisions. Abdominal surgery is the most invasive approach. The incisions are either up and down between the belly button and the pubic bone or across what many women refer to as a bikini incision. Some hysterectomies can be performed vaginally, but there are many limitations to this approach. The first is the importance of evaluating or removing the ovaries. This cannot be performed reliably through the vagina. The second is a history of scarring, endometriosis, or previous surgery. The third is a suspicion or a diagnosis of cancer. And finally, vaginal surgery can be very difficult or even dangerous in obese women. Due to recent advances in minimally invasive approaches to hysterectomy, more and more gynecologic surgeons are performing hysterectomy using what's called a laparoscopic approach. Myomectomies are also quite common. About 40,000 procedures are performed in the United States each year. Most of these procedures are performed through abdominal incisions. Some gynecologic surgeons have begun performing myomectomies with minimally invasive surgical approaches. Myomectomies are indicated if you have fibroids but are still trying to get pregnant. A minimally invasive surgical approach offers many advantages for a shorter recovery. Now that we have talked about some common gynecologic conditions and their various treatment options, let's discuss some of the approaches that are available when surgery is needed. As I alluded to earlier, if you need a hysterectomy, it can be done with a traditional approach and open abdominal incision. This incision may be vertical or transverse. Now, however, many physicians are offering minimally invasive surgery for hysterectomy. Minimally invasive approaches include a vaginal hysterectomy, a hysterectomy with conventional laparoscopy, or a robotic hysterectomy. There are many advantages to minimally invasive surgery. These include reduced blood loss, fewer complications, a shorter stay in the hospital, a faster recovery, and less scarring. Vaginal surgery may be appropriate for you for certain gynecologic problems. The pros of vaginal surgery include that it is less invasive. There is no scar on the abdomen, and often you spend only one night in the hospital. There is also significantly less pain with a vaginal approach than there is with an abdominal hysterectomy. Cons to vaginal surgery are that it can be difficult to perform. The physician may not be able to see as well, and it may be difficult to control bleeding from the vascular tissues that give blood supply to the pelvic organs. In addition, vaginal surgery may not be indicated for certain types of patients. If you have never had children or have large fibroids or other types of large masses, you may not be able to have the surgery performed vaginally. Cancer operations are rarely performed vaginally as they usually require much more extensive surgery than a vaginal approach could offer. Finally, if you have significant adhesions or scar tissue from endometriosis or prior surgeries, this could make vaginal surgery unfeasible. 
On the other hand, laparoscopic surgery is performed through very small keyhole incisions in the abdomen, rather than one long continuous incision. Laparoscopic surgery begins with the surgeon inserting a video telescope or camera through a small incision, usually in the belly button. The abdomen is filled with carbon dioxide gas to create a working space between the organs and the abdominal wall. Then, several additional small keyhole incisions are made. Through these incisions, sleeves are inserted. Through these sleeves, different types of instruments can be passed that perform various functions like grasping, cutting, or cauterizing. Some of the drawbacks of conventional laparoscopic surgery include that the surgeon is operating while looking at a two-dimensional image, usually on a flat screen monitor. An assistant is hand holding the camera, resulting in a shaky image. The assistant, not the surgeon, is in control of where the camera points. Also, the instruments themselves are rigid and are limited in how they can be moved. The instruments are controlled at a distance with the surgeon's hand outside of the patient's abdomen, similar to holding a pair of chopsticks. This results in reduced dexterity, reduced precision, and reduced control of the instruments. It also leads to greater sur surgeon fatigue. With conventional laparoscopic surgery, very complex operations can be quite difficult or impossible to perform. However, Conventional laparoscopic surgery is an excellent option for minor or straightforward surgical procedures like tubal ligations or removal of ovarian cysts. How can we overcome these drawbacks of conventional laparoscopic surgery? Many surgeons around the country, like myself, now have access to the da Vinci surgical system. This system provides state-of-the-art robotic technology and allows me to be completely in control of the operation. Rather than standing and watching a two-dimensional flat image, I sit down at a console and am immersed in a three-dimensional, high-definition, stable view of the surgical field. I direct the instruments at all times while controlling the arms on the console. Even smaller, very precise movements of my hands are transmitted to the instruments inside the patient's abdomen in real time. Conventional laparoscopic instruments are rigid and do not have the ability to rotate like a human wrist. The endo-wrist instruments part of the da Vinci surgical system, move like a human wrist with seven degrees of freedom. This allows me to operate with increased dexterity and precision. These endo-wrist instruments fit through small dime-sized incisions or keyhole incisions. A wide range of instruments are available to perform almost any type of task that might be required. In addition to the number of many benefits to the patient, there are also many benefits to me, the surgeon, as well. These include improved visualization, better control of the instruments, improved surgical dexterity for complex aspects of the operation, easier and faster suturing, and less surgeon fatigue. This slide shows a picture of the typical configuration of these small keyhole incisions that might be used for access to perform a robotic assisted surgery. When you compare the benefits of different surgical approaches, you can see that the da Vinci surgical system offers many advantages. In general, smaller incisions result in less scarring, less pain, a shorter hospital stay, shorter recovery, and quicker return to normal activities. Da Vinci gynecologic surgery is not indicated for everyone. It does allow me to perform a broader range of surgeries for more complex patient problems than ever before. For example, in the past, Women who needed a radical hysterectomy for cervical cancer almost always had to have an open incision. A radical hysterectomy done with conventional laparoscopy was not widely accepted by gynecologic oncologists due to the concern that the lack of surgical precision could compromise an adequate cancer operation. However, the da Vinci radical hysterectomy is now being performed by many gynecologic oncologists around the United States with excellent surgical results. Endometrial cancer has been treated with conventional laparoscopy for some time now with good surgical results, but it can be technically difficult to perform and quite exhausting for the surgeon. Only about 15% of women with endometrial cancer have been enjoying the benefit of minimally invasive surgery prior to the robotic approach. And in many cases, when the surgeon did try to perform the surgery laparoscopically, they ended up converting to open surgery anyway, often under duress, because they were unable to complete the operation or ran into complications. 
The advantages of the robotic approach have allowed almost all women with endometrial cancer in my practice to have minimally invasive surgery. Other indications for robotic surgery include prolapse. Surgery for vaginal or uterine prolapse can be performed with conventional laparoscopy, but as we discussed before, laparoscopic suturing may not be reliable. Robotic suturing is reliable and intuitive. In addition, surgery for endometriosis can be quite complex, and the Da Vinci surgical system provides the increased precision required to perform these surgeries safely. Surgery for large uterine fibroids can be difficult or impossible to perform with conventional laparoscopy, but now they can be performed by experienced robotic surgeons through a few small incisions. Finally, surgery on obese patients can be difficult for a number of reasons. Obese women are at much greater risk for wound infections and wound healing problems, increased blood loss, and surgical injuries. These are the patients that benefit the most from a minimally invasive approach. The Da Vinci surgical system allows me to offer minimally invasive surgery to a much greater number of obese patients. Now let's talk in more detail about some of the goals of Da Vinci hysterectomy. Robotic surgery means a minimally invasive approach to hysterectomy. It enables the gynecologist to perform the surgery for more advanced types of gynecologic problems. Again, the benefits to you include a shorter hospital stay, less pain and scarring, and a quicker return to normal activities. Let's take a look at the goals of da Vinci myomectomy. Again, it enables the surgeon to offer a minimally invasive approach to the removal of uterine fibroids while preserving the uterus for fertility. Most myomectomies are currently performed through open incisions, and conventional laparoscopy can be very difficult to learn and perform, particularly due to the difficulty of conventional laparoscopic suturing. Da Vinci myomectomy en enables you to retain your uterus and therefore your ability to have children. In addition, you can reap the many benefits of a minimally invasive approach. I'd like to say a few words about how the Da Vinci surgical system can be used for different types of gynecologic cancer surgery. Traditionally, surgery for gynecologic cancers, like many other types of cancers, have involved large incisions with extensive operations that can result in a feeling of disfigurement. By employing a minimally invasive surgical technique, even for cancer operations, patients can maintain a greater self-esteem and quality of life. In the past, conventional laparoscopy has fallen short of being an adequate surgical approach for complex cancer operations. In addition, conventional laparoscopic surgery can be difficult to perform. With the Da Vinci surgical system, more advanced operations can be performed with a minimally invasive approach. The benefits we discussed before of shorter hospital stay, minimal pain and scarring, and quick recovery can also apply to women with conditions as serious as cancer. A radical hysterectomy, which is a complex pelvic operation for cervical cancer, involves removing the cervix, the uterus, the tissue around the cervix called the parametrium, and the upper portion of the vagina. Sometimes it will also include removing the fallopian tubes and ovaries but this is not necessarily a part of the radical hysterectomy. In addition, removal of pelvic lymph nodes is also performed. Some surgeons have reported performing radical hysterectomies with traditional laparoscopy, but the gynecologic oncology community has not embraced this operation as being reliable enough to adequately treat and potentially cure cervical cancer. With the added dexterity and three-dimensional visualization of the da Vinci surgical system, I can now perform radical hysterectomies with all of the benefits of minimally invasive surgery. On this slide, surgical staging for endometrial cancer is shown. With this operation, removal of the uterus, cervix, both ovaries and tubes, lymph nodes in the pelvis, and sometimes lymph nodes in the lower abdomen are also removed. The Da Vinci surgical system provides an excellent way of performing surgical staging for endometrial cancer. As a surgeon who has performed hundreds of operations for endometrial cancer using conventional laparoscopy, I have noticed a significant improvement in tissue handling with the Da Vinci surgical system. With gentler handling of the tissues, I think my patients experience less postoperative pain and a shorter recovery. Now let me address a few questions that patients frequently ask me about robotic gynecologic surgery. What physical limitations will I have after the operation and when will I be able to resume activities such as working, driving, and exercise? Of course, every woman recovers differently from her operation. 
So these answers just give some general expectations. After robotic surgery, most patients are able to resume driving in about a week. Because we only make a few small incisions, tissue is not spread during the procedure. This shortens your healing and recovery time, lowers your risk of infection, and minimizes pain after surgery. Because robotic surgery is a less invasive surgical option, most women go home the next day and return to work by the third week. Walking is possible immediately, and more vigorous exercise can begin by about the third week. Is robotic surgery a standard operation? How safe is robotic surgery? While robotic technology is a relatively new approach to gynecologic surgery, the Da Vinci surgical system has been used in tens of thousands of procedures worldwide for many years. Essentially, Da Vinci is minimally invasive or laparoscopic surgery that can achieve significantly better results due to the application of robotic technology. The features of the system enhance the surgeon's capabilities, which make it possible to provide you with all of the benefits of a minimally invasive procedure, including reduced risk of infection and complications. For example, the superior high-definition magnified three-dimensional vision helps the surgeon to see the target anatomy better without the need for a large incision. The robotic instruments that move like a human wrist provide unparalleled precision and dexterity, making it possible to perform more complex dissection and repair. With the Da Vinci system, the surgeon is seated at a console and always in full control of the instrument's small movements. This makes the operation intuitive for the surgeon and lets her fully concentrate on the target anatomy. Another advantage of using the Da Vinci system is that the assistant has complete access to the surgical site and can insist during complex steps of the procedure. Surgical tasks can be greatly facilitated with this support. Many research studies have looked at the safety of this technology with excellent results. Studies have also demonstrated excellent surgical outcomes with fewer complications than other techniques. Isn't open surgery safer for many patients? More difficult or complex gynecologic surgery with adhesions due to endometriosis or prior pelvic surgery are often difficult to perform laparoscopically, which can lead to conversion to open surgery. Some surgeons perform more complex gynecologic surgery through open incisions for precisely this reason. Robotic surgery helps to overcome the limitations of laparoscopy by enabling the surgeon to visualize and dissect compromised anatomy and tissue planes, giving the gynecologic surgeon a better tool to perform a minimally invasive endoscopic surgery for the majority of their surgical candidates. How soon can I expect to be able to have sexual relations after surgery? As with any surgery, it will take time for your body to heal and return to normal function. The extent and length of recovery depends on a number of factors, including the type of surgery you had, your age, and on the level of functionality you had before the surgery. With that said, the general rule of thumb after hysterectomy is about six to eight weeks for resuming intercourse. Other types of sexual relations are safe as soon as you feel ready. In summary, robotic technology has revolutionized gynecologic surgery. For more information on Da Vinci Surgery, visit the website at davincisurgery.com. And if you or someone you love has a gynecologic condition that may require surgery, feel free to call me at my office to arrange a consultation. The contact information is provided here. My practice is limited to taking care of women with gynecologic cancers or with complex gynecologic conditions requiring surgery. To locate a Da Vinci surgeon in your area, visit the surgeon locator on davincisurgery.com. Also, check out Dr. K TV, the YouTube channel for my practice that includes new updates and educational videos regarding gynecologic surgery. I appreciate you spending some time with me today to learn more about gynecologic surgery. I hope this program was helpful and stimulates you to think about different options that are available to you if your gynecologist recommends surgery. It is important to ask questions, be involved, and work with your doctor to find the surgical approach that is best for you.